Yeah. That makes you wonder where, what are, what are you diving into? Is it like a pulsar, you know, some sort of, you know, you know you're going faster than the speed of light, right? I mean, you know you are. In this, because all those stars are stretched. and But then it pauses every once in a while and it makes you wonder, well, what's happening there? Is that my brain isn't registering? Yes. Uh, you know, I don't know. So. And uh, I think Kubrick was the first one to do an effect like this in 68, 69, when he was making 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yeah. And it's been picked up so many places. Um, do you remember a movie called Brainstorm? No. Natalie Wood's last film. And, uh, oh, this has to be around 1980. And they are inventing what we would call a VR headset. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, they find a way to record what's in your brain. And then someone else can put on the VR headset and have your experience. Yeah, that's what my Oculus does. I, uh, yeah. I have an and, experience uh, with it on. I run into walls and stuff and then right. let somebody else do it. And then right. I see them run into walls. It really uh, it must be working. In the movie, it would give you a full sensory experience. Right. And uh, towards the end of the film, uh, the female scientist who's developed this is having a heart attack. She realizes she's dying and oh, no. she puts on the recording headset to record her own death. Oh, and uh, then the movie goes on from there. And of course, you know, it's like the Chekhov play where there's a gun on the wall, someone's going to get shot. And so, you know, somebody's going to play this and, um, the the thing that they present as the death experience is very much like what you've got here, you know, going into the light, uh, the different things streaming past you. And right. uh, it's just, it's very interesting. It's like NDE, I guess. Near yes, death. very much so. Very much so. And the... Uh, <clears throat> I won't spoil it if anybody's going to pick up the film. Brainstorm is the name of it. It's, re it's really lovely. Right. I'm getting uh, new cabinetry built for my, my film library. We have three libraries here at the ranch. We have the one that's in the background that you can see, which is my professional library. Okay. Physics, astronomy, mathematics, um, and a few other things. And then there's a... Uh, fiction, art, history library in the room next door. But then downstairs, we have the uh, the film library. And we have over 4,400 titles. Cool. In our film library. And we have run out of space. We had uh, <clears throat> a system of five bookcases, basically, that gave us about 800 linear inches of storage space and we're having five new seven foot tall three foot wide bookcases which will give us um about 1400 linear inches of storage space Jeez. so we're almost we're going to be doubling to be able to hold a library of approaching uh eight or nine thousand titles so wow books <clears throat> or videos Yes. Yes. Well, okay. Yeah, they're all they're all on they're all on DVD. So Right. Uh and I have I have quite the uh quite the film library. So that's cool, man. Fun that's stuff for happening to, at the ranch. This isn't something I can like get a library card for and check anything out though, right? Um, you know what? I I really <laughs> hate uh, loan because I've lost so many copies of movies. Well, they don't come back. Bad. That's right. <laughs> and so what I tell people is like, you know what? Come on out to the house. Okay. You know, pretzels and beer, or popcorn and pizza and whatever. And yes, absolutely, we have sixty five. Okay, well, that's cool. Green and come on out. And uh, yeah, I do get takers. I do get takers, but nice. uh, it's astounding the kind of depth. Um, I'm a big Sherlock Holmes fan, so we have. Oh yeah. We have about 115 Sherlock Holmes. Right. Uh, 
films and, and episodes from various series and about 13 different actors playing Holmes. So everybody thinks, oh, Brendan Cumberbatch and uh, Jeremy Brett and um, Basil Rathbone are the three that everybody knows. But we have really a lot of, uh, we have it in depth. Watch this, this is cool. I think I've shown it before, but it goes with the subject pretty well. It does. And it's just stunning. It is just stunning. Look at this. Ah, oh, man. I love that. Me too. And what I love is you can see craters where it's sun sunlight is just appearing. Yeah. Sunlight is just appearing, and you're going, oh my gosh, wow. That's that's so astonishing that sunlight is just appearing there and you can see the play of shadow and uh, you think about it and you go wow and people have walked there but there's so many places we haven't been you know we've, we've touched down on what five different landing sites yeah and explored a few square miles Sielkowski, that's what that is. That's Sielkowski, I think, on the lunar far side. And uh, just to be able to walk out across Mare Glumorum, I, 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 uh, I have a few science fiction books. And in one of them, the, uh, the main character lives in a colony built into the oh, look at that. crater. I love that. The Earthrise. He talks about driving out from the crater, driving out onto the sea. And of course, he's talking about driving out onto Mari Humora and uh, prospecting and different things. And uh, just, it looks so flat here and even from orbit. And you know that it's, it's a lie, it's a place full of texture. And. Uh, yeah, Orientali. <clears throat> what a close-up view the Apollo 13 people had, too. It was awesome. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So that, that was a reenactment of what they saw. Well, hello everybody, it's Scott Roberts and Dr. Daniel Barth, and this is episode number eight of How Do You Know? Um, and uh, Daniel is gonna talk about uh, the moon. I mean, I love the moon. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a globe that I have, but it's almost identical. In fact, it might be identical to the one that-, that uh, Yours has a, has a signature that mine yeah. doesn't. Yeah, but uh, you know you can't get enough of watching the lunar terrain and and uh, you know seeing the dramatic uh, shadows stretching across the crater floors and craterlets and you know uh, these. Uh, I love to see where you know uh, comets, probably broken apart comets, have impacted where it makes like lines of craters and absolutely this, this kind of thing and and just you know even from my earliest observations, naked eye observations of looking at the moon, imagining Neil and Buzz setting foot on the surface and all the rest of it. I mean, my mind just was swirling with what must be going on. And Isn't it astonishing though? The danger of it and all of that stuff was just uh, so, so incredible. But, um, but you know, admittedly, Daniel, uh, as long as I've been observing the moon, I can name a few craters and maybe some regions, that kind of thing. I really don't know the moon as well as I should, you know. And uh, I think that's what this program is kind of about, right? It is. It is. Um, uh, the pandemic, of course, as you know, has really, there's upsides to everything. 
the pandemic has uh, made us value our human connections more, our personal connections. Uh, certainly, I've I've come to really appreciate uh, the connections that I have with other astronomers, with my students and uh, teachers around the world. But it's it's really launched this tremendous renaissance of interest in astronomy as a hobby. And I've noticed over my lifetime, I've I've been an active observer for more than 50 years now. Uh, I've been a telescope owner for more than 50 years since I was a, a small boy. And telescope and astronomy interest tends to wax and wane. Uh, I was kind of on my own when I was younger, but then the uh, the space program and the Apollo missions, everybody's like, wow, cool. And interest in owning a telescope went up and then it, it fell off a bit and then Comet tail bop in the 90s and uh, a few other things in the Voyager missions. And now, now the COVID-19, which is a very interesting side effect that we now have all these people. And <clears throat> I see an awful lot of social media posts where somebody says, ooh, ooh I, I just got this scope. And they, they post a picture of their, their nice new instrument. And uh, the comments are, I, I mentioned before the show, I saw this fellow who posted a picture of a lovely 12 inch Dobsonian. Uh, one of these uh, basically inexpensive, uh, the plywood base and the, the sauna tube type optical tube with the mirror in the bottom and a, a simple Crayford focuser on top of a, a very nice instrument to start with, to launch your hobby on. And the first thing he says, I just got this and I wanna put it on an equatorial mount and do astrophotography cheap. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, wow, talk yeah. about, uh, let's jump into the deep end of the now shark infested pool. Um, my advice for people who start out in astronomy, my gosh, let's enjoy the view at the eyepiece. It's stunning how beautiful it is. And as we've talked about before, Scott, the more knowledge you bring to the eyepiece, the more good you take away from it. The more wonder, the more delight when you understand what you're seeing. And we've talked about this before. We, I've had and you've had people who come up and you say, what are you looking at? Oh, it's the moon. Oh, can I see? And reactions fall into kind of two classes. There's one, the delighted inner child or actual child. Wow, that's so amazing. Oh my gosh, look at all the craters and what are the dark spots? And uh, then there's the person, oh yeah, it's the moon, I've seen it. Uh, right. I just, uh, uh, the, I've the seen second. it. Yeah, I, I, have, I have experiences like this too. Uh, and I've told them yes, before, like one time going to Palomar Observatory and being able to use the 60-inch uh, uh, Oscar Mayer telescope, which is a fine instrument. And about 60, and some people argue, maybe even upwards of 70 some odd inches, is about the limit of what a human eye can work with on a telescope, okay? It has to do with the beam of light that's gonna come out and all the rest of it, and a reasonable magnification that you can actually really use. Um, uh, they had turned the telescope, they were gonna do all these deep sky objects, but the moon was there and they said, How, who would like to see the moon? And they had the scope aimed right at it. The eyepiece is sticking straight out the back of the telescope, there was no diagonal. And there was this projection, I mean this beam of light that you could see on the observatory floor, really bright, okay? <laughs> and this was um, uh, members of, uh, old time members of the San Diego Astronomy Association, this has got it. This is over 20 years ago, and people just backed up and they said, "I'm not going to ruin my eyes by looking at the moon like that," you know. And I, I said, "Guys, just get let, get out of the way. I'm going to look at the moon with a 60-inch telescope." And it was absolutely stunning, as you might imagine. It was really beautiful, gently rolling hills, craterlets on on top of craterlets. You know, it, it was like flying over the surface, and and that is seared seared into my memory and i'm still to this day uh, appalled that people especially astronomers wouldn't want to look at the moon you know it's it is true that much light in your eye is like a punch in the face it's just like a punch in the nose it's it's physically stunning and that can be true with a with a 
10 or 12 inch Dobsonian or a six inch refractor. You put, you're out in the dark and your eye is dark adapted and you put your eye into this, it's a violent cone of light. And it's just, it is, it's a smack in the face. But your body adapts and then the sense of wonder takes over and the, oh my gosh, it's amazing. And uh, what I like to do with my big refractor when the moon is out, I like to go ahead because it's a, it's a lovely 133 millimeter F12. So it's a seven, it's a two meter long tube. <clears throat> and you put a really nice high power eyepiece. Okay, here we go, 250, 350 power. And you just hand somebody the controller, right? It's a, it's a driven mount and you hand them the controller and you say, okay, this is gonna be like flying over the surface and just take the controller left, right, up, down and just move along and see what you can discover. And people are sitting there and they're just staring and their thumbs are going on the controller. They're sitting here with the, and they're like, oh my God, it's like flying. Yeah. And it is. <clears throat> and that's, that's the wonderful experience. And you, you, you delight in that as an astronomer when you show somebody and it, you, you know you are making a core memory that will last them the lifetime. Um, for me, going out um, uh, the first time with a telescope, my village priest had a telescope in his office and he took all the kids out one night and here's the moon, here's different things. Oh, and I'm one of the last ones hanging out. What's that? It's Saturn. He said, well, you know how to operate it now. Go ahead and put it in the finder and then focus it. And, and you know, it's like, the hook is set for life yeah. now. That's right. a core memory that's over 50 years ago. And I still remember it. I can, I can tell you who was there and what it was like. And the, it, it was just a, a life-changing experience. I often talk when I speak publicly. As an astronomer, I want to set hearts afire for astronomy and space science and the wonder of our, of our universe. I want to set hearts afire. And a uh, view of the moon with a telescope can do that. But it's true, on the other hand, familiarity does breed contempt. You know, I tried to look up who said that. And that saying goes back thousands of years. Uh, some of the, a couple of the Romans uh, were known. Uh, to have said this. And St. Augustine quoted it as a proverb everybody knows, that familiarity breeds contempt. Mm -hmm. And I've had people, and I show them a picture of my refractor, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to share this, and I'll put it over here, and I think I can use the share screen. There we go. There's my refractor. And... Uh, I show that picture to people. You can see the tractor in the background. That's because it's 350 pounds of equipment. You're right. And yes, when we set it up, we do use the tractor to haul it out. And uh, people look at it and it's like, is that real? Because it's, it's, it's so, uh, it's your stereotypical image of what a professional astronomer's yeah. telescope would look like. Tell people think telescope. And they think this. <laughs> they, that's what they think of. Wow, yeah. is that real? Yes. Oh my gosh, it's yours. Yes, it is. Well, what do you look at? Oh, I really love to study the moon. And like, really? You have this beautiful telescope? Why would you want to spend time staring at the moon? Oh my God. I'm like, you're kidding. Why wouldn't you? If you could get views with any kind of a telescope you could afford, if you could get views like we can easily get with a modest telescope of the moon, if you could get views like that of uh, Mercury or, or uh, Jupiter or Saturn, it would, it would be stunning. But the moon gives us the ability to look at something that really is spectacular and beautiful. Because the moon has virtually no water, and I know we've discovered water in deep craters on the poles and all of that, yeah, yeah, okay. But the crust, is, it's, it's the most fierce desert known to man. It is the most ferocious right. desert. Mercury has more water than the moon does. Yeah, the Apollo astronauts themselves have described it as a dead planet. You know? Yes, it is magnificent desolation. That's what Buzz Aldrin right. said. That's and, right. And uh, but the interesting thing, this magnificent desolation, not only is it small and its core cooled very quickly, 
it had a period of volcanic uh, availability where you could actually have lava events about 3.7 to 4 billion years ago. But after about 3.5 billion years ago, the core effectively solidified. There may be some pockets of magma and gases and things today, but basically this planet has been geologically dead for three and a half billion years. It's also not only waterless, it's airless. If we think about Mars, Mars is a very fierce desert. There's a lot of water under the surface, planet-wide, but there's no, there, and there have been recent, within the last hundred million years, recent volcanism, but uh, Mars has an atmosphere. It's very thin, but wind erosion is a very significant phenomena on Mars. It fills craters, it erases them, it wipes out features, it erodes rock. The moon has nothing like this. The moon is essentially a geological doodle pad that has never been erased. You think about uh, a whiteboard. If you've ever gone into a classroom where young children have been gotten loose and grabbed the markers, and I've seen this before with teacher friends who've brought their children to their young children to school. Mommy's working now in grading papers. You guys have some markers and just go crazy on the whiteboard. And they fill the whiteboard with drawings and images and scribbles and they erase nothing. This is a wonderful metaphor for the moon. Nothing has been erased in three and a half billion years. The only erosion is rocks falling from space. <laughs> you think about that. The only erosion is when from the entire surface of the moon, something falls and strikes and knocks something out of place or erodes something down. The rate of erosion on the, moon, on the earth is something approaching 10 million times greater than it is on the moon. Uh, the moon's erosion rate is if, for all intents and purposes, zero. We get new craters on top of old ones because the entire surface is crater saturated. But nevertheless, we can see a marvelous record of tremendous impacts, great and small, and their effects. But for this week, what I'd like to do is reach out to all the new astronomers out there, to all the people who've said, ooh, ooh, I'm stuck at home, let's buy a telescope. And there are perhaps millions of them worldwide. The, the telescope industry has just boomed in the last 18 months because of the pandemic. And I wanna reach out to all the old astronomers who've had telescopes, especially the folks who have their big astrophotography rigs. Uh, I had a dear friend come over to my house uh, a few weeks ago. We set up the great big telescope when that, uh, the Apple Max, when that picture was taken. And he said, I'm gonna bring my telescope. I wanna take some pictures of the Leo triplet and Thor's helmet and whatnot. And I said, okay. And uh, he spent about 10 minutes looking through my refractor and then for the next four hours, he was sitting on the ground on a blanket, staring at a laptop, imaging with his telescope. And I'm like, wow, okay. I'm like, how many pictures did you get? He says, well, I have enough exposures to make two good images. One of the Leo triplet, three galaxies together in one of Thor's helmet. And he said, that's a good night's work. I'm like, in four hours? He said, yeah. Hmm. To all these very experienced people, these astro imagers, I would like to introduce you to your next door neighbor, <laughs> to the moon. And I would, you, we were talking and you said you didn't know the moon as well as you would like. Right, it's true. I mean, I'm willing and, to and I guess that may be true for everybody, but I'm always really <laughs> impressed by the amateur astronomer who, connects this ridge with that, you know, and knows something about the geology of it and uh, um, and could just, you know, study an eyepiece and name crater after crater after crater, so. Yeah, I, I would like to invite all of our experienced people to get reacquainted with the moon, especially for our new astronomers, Scott. One of the interesting things about the moon, and we get a, we get a telescope, and it's our very first one and we've got our shiny new eight inch job or our new 90 millimeter refractor. And 
let's go out. I want to see the universe tonight. <laughs> and uh, if astronomy will teach you anything, it will teach you patience. And is it, is it a mixed metaphor to say astronomy teaches you patience immediately? Maybe it is, but it's true. <laughs> and right. somebody says, well, I'm like, okay, uh, most of us can look at a globe and say, oh, North America, South America, Europe, there's England, there's Africa, Asia. Oh, look, it's Australia. So that must be New Zealand, Indonesia. And we can, we can name places, but the moon is just as available. That globe sits displayed for us every single clear night uh, for a little bit of time with very few exceptions, new moon, of course, but uh, most of the time people go up, eh, it's the moon and they don't take any time to get to know their neighbor. So what I'd like to invite people to do is come along tonight for a short hour. And then uh, over the next month, pick a month and explore the moon because really where the moon shows her stuff, the most magnificently is along the Terminator. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, put up a nice image of the crescent moon. And I'm going to share this. And we take a look. Here we go. We've got this lovely image. This is an image that I took, uh, oh, I don't know, a few years back. Nice. <clears throat> and this was taken through um, an Explorer Scientific 127 APO. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful scope for imaging. And this was uh, a single, this is not stacked. People talk about stag took 150 exposures and combined them to one high texture image. This is in effect one exposure. So if we uh, zoom in a bit here, the Terminator friends is this lovely line that defines the boundary between daylight and darkness. As we're looking at the moon, what we have to realize when we're seeing, and this is uh, a moon that's about three days, four days after new moon. It's a very young moon. You would see this uh, waxing moon. The term waxing means to increase or to grow. And what we're looking at here is the moon between new and full. And you're going to say, gee, when's the next new moon? And of course, there are apps for that. And yes, I have one too. <clears throat> and I'm looking at... Uh, the next new moon is May 11. So sometime in the few days after May 11, uh, the weekend of the 14th would be a great time to start on your moon exploration. And this is what the moon would look like on about May 16. And that's about, uh, oh, it's about four days or so, four or five days after the new moon date. <clears throat> what we see is this terminator was this boundary line between daylight and darkness. What we're really looking at is the eastern side of the moon to the right here, the western side to the left. The sun rises in the east, Scott. So what we're seeing is this region is just experiencing mm -hmm. sunrise. And this line represents the boundary where if you were there, you would just see the rim of the sun yep. peeking the over terminated. the horizon. There we go. And when we look at this first quarter, we're going to mainly look at Maria today. Maria, uh, Latin for sea. These are the dark circular regions on the moon. Galileo christened them as Maria. He looked and said uh, that he looked at these features and he was reminded of the way a lake or the sea looked like if you were looking down from a hilltop. Here's the bright landscape and here's this dark area. And he said, those dark areas must be seas. And uh, in 1610, he published uh, Sidereus Nuncus, the starry messenger. Right. And uh, he said, these are seas on the moon. It didn't take him very long. Within the next year, he realized that he was in error. Because looking at these features, here's a Maria. This is Mari Crisium, the Sea of Crises. And uh, they all have very fanciful, lovely, romantic names. And he realized, oh, there's no clouds. There's no storms. 
not once, not ever. Later, he did some interesting experiments where he would watch the moon occult a star. The moon passes in front of a star. And Galileo noted that when a moon passes in front of the star, especially when the dark limb of the moon passes in front of a star, the star winks out like a candle blown. And he realized, ah, had there been any atmosphere, the star would get dimmer and dimmer and twinkle and then finally fade away because he noticed, oh, our sun, it's dim at sunrise and sunset and it gets brighter. And he said, I don't see any of these things. The moon must be dry and airless. But of course, by the time he realized this, the book had been published, the name Maria, Latin for sea, stuck. And so when we're looking here, we can start to see our first couple of Maria. And we have Mare Chrysium right here. And then uh, I'm going to change my view and take a look. We have Mare Chrysium. <clears throat> And then looking along, and I want to make sure I name this correctly, <clears throat> we've got fecunditatus. The sea of fertility is right here. And so we've got our first two Maria, uh, fecunditatus. And fecunditatus, it isn't round. It's, it's this kind of odd, almost like a mushroom shape, uh, fecunditatus, sea of fertility, which is one of the most ironic names ever. There is, the moon is one of the most sterile environments we've ever uh, encountered. Uh, but we've got fecunditatus. And so we've got our first image of the moon that's uh, about a week old and we're seeing some interesting things. Um, these things are really big. Uh, Chrysium is about 345 miles wide. Uh, it's a bit bigger than Arkansas, our home state, Scott. Uh, and fecunditatus is larger. It's about 520 miles wide. So now you're getting some really large things. If you are patient and you wait a few days, aha, you can wait and discover <clears throat> the first quarter moon. And people are often puzzled and they say, why is it the first quarter when it's half lit? Well, the best way to describe that, we've got a lovely document here. This is a full quick moon sketch. is when it's half lit, right? <laughs> full moon is halfway around. If we start our lunar orbit here at the new moon phase, here's yeah. our crescent, and we're showing it as going anti-clockwise because if we're looking down from high above the Earth's north pole, this is in fact what we would see. And one quarter of the way around, and if you look and see, <clears throat> and you go, oh, golly, here's, uh, here's the crescent moon, and it's half lit. And uh, we see that ah, when we're looking at it here from Earth, we're looking out, and we're going to see a half lit moon that looks just like this. Now, we've got this lovely image, and now we're starting to see some interesting detail. Here's Chrysium, of course, up near the limb. Here's Fecunditatus, the Sea of Fertility. And these next two, the, these three that go in a diagonal line, Fertility, Tranquility, Serenity. Maybe that's like Shakespeare's uh, Three Ages of Man, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Fertility, Tranquility, Serenity. Tranquility is where, of course, Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong landed in 1969. And we're looking at this and going, oh, we notice when we look, there's a very distinct difference between these four Maria. Do you notice, Scott, how much darker that the Sea of Tranquility is? How much darker the lava is? And yeah. in fact, when we have compared the samples we've had from Tranquility and uh, Fertility and a few of the other places where the Apollo astronauts have landed, Sea of Tranquility, the lava, the basalt, has a lot more iron. The moon's crust is very rich in aluminum and magnesium. Yeah. And that makes for this bright, silvery landscape. But Tranquility here, this 
asteroid that slammed into this, and this would have been an asteroid uh, a good hundred miles wide, literally a mountain range, not just a mountain, a small world in itself, would have impacted here. And it tapped into a pocket of magma in the moon's interior that was extremely rich in iron. And one interesting thing, and I'm going to see if I can zoom in here. I can. And I want to show you something very interesting. Take a look. Here's tranquility. Here's serenity. Do you notice this right here, Scott? Yeah. This line of dark lava. Oh, that's, and, not, that's not just like a, a crater edge? No, it is not. That's okay. a difference in composition of the landscape. Oh. What that tells you is tranquility is younger than serenity. Mm -hmm. Because what's happened is these lava flows have come up and they've broken down the rim of this basin and overflowed onto it. And if you have a very nice telescope and you can get a nice view, say around 350 power, you can see ripples in the landscape oh. that run parallel. Just as you would imagine if you had, uh, have you seen videos, Scott, maybe of the tsunami from Japan a few years back? Oh yeah. Where yeah. the water is rushing over the landscape and yeah. you're seeing these ripples, yes. right? these standing waves that are perpendicular to the flow. The water's right. flowing this way and the ripples are running that way. You right. can see that the flood here was a flood of molten stone going this way and the ripples run perpendicular to it and you can see them extending out uh, 50 or 60 miles into the interior of Mare Serenitatis. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we're looking at this and we're seeing a flood, evidence of a flood of literally biblical proportions, not of water, but of molten stone, no ark would have sufficed. Right. And, uh, these uh, these impact and basin filling events were not instantaneous, to be sure. These asteroids that make these huge basins and these these average altimeter data shows that these are averaging to be something between three and five kilometers deep. And you realize, oh, that's three to five kilometers after they got done being filled from the inside with lava. And these asteroids would have slammed into the lunar crust and punctured and fractured it. Right. And through these fractures, magma upwelled. And uh, some of these images of the Iceland volcanoes, where you've got the ridges where magma is just boiling out, you would have had something similar. And the lava continued to flow for more than a million years. Wow before these basins were filled. So wow. this was not a quick process. It would have been cool to see, you know, uh, you know, the, the moon in phase with glowing magma, you know, yes. around some of these basins yes. and stuff like that. You um, know. And these basins, they average about 3.7 to 3.9 billion years. And that's based on uh, samples of rock that have been brought back from the Apollo astronauts and they've been radiocarbon dated. And so they realized these great Maria, this was what they call the Noachian period, uh, a period of intense bombardment. There's an alternate theory. We know that the moon was formed by a giant impact, a Mars sized planet that had been christened Tethys and no one has ever seen Tethys, of course, because it slammed into the Earth about 4.2 billion years ago. Most of Tethys penetrated down and merged with the core of the Earth. The Earth has a much larger iron core compared to other planets its size, because surprise, it's made up of more than one planet squashed together. Mm -hmm. And what happened during this impact a great deal of material was blasted into orbit. The Earth would have had a rocky ring. And within, scientists estimate computer models and seem to indicate, within about one to two million years, most of these pieces clumped in orbit to form the modern moon. Um, there would have been, of course, 
a tremendous and deadly rain of um, meteor impacts, mountain size and bigger, dinosaur killer scale impacts raining all over the earth in this time. But what really the moon is made of is the lighter crust materials, the materials that were light enough to be blasted into orbit. The heavyweight materials all sank to the center mm -hmm. and made the earth's core and mantle. The moon is made, it's like the earth, but it's like the earth's crust, but not its interior. It's generally iron poor, where the earth is very iron rich and lighter metals, aluminum, magnesium, form the composite minerals of most of the surface. And so what these could be is the last very large pieces that were orbiting that slammed into the moon, or they might've been pieces from deep outer space somewhere else in the asteroid belt. To solve that mystery, Scott, we'd have to go and do some serious deep core drilling and see what those samples look like. If they look like they're Earth-like, like the Earth's core materials. When you then say go, serious deep core, what are you talking about, miles? Uh, I, would, I would think you would need to go five to 10 kilometers deep. That's pretty deep. It's, it's quite deep. It's as deep as we can reach into the Earth today. It matches the deepest boreholes we've got now. But you figure something slamming in um, in an impact like this, the impactor vaporizes on impact. There's so much kinetic energy. It's, it's just obscene, the amount of kinetic energy. And it's uh, an impact that would make even uh, a crater like Tycho, a hundred kilometer crater would on the moon. If we had a new hundred to 150 kilometer crater on the moon, it would kill people on the earth because it would blast enough chunks into orbit, they're going to fall into the nearest gravity well. Hello, that's us. And uh, we would have, uh, you remember the Chelyabinsk meteor. If you all are looking on, on the show, look up Russian meteor, wonderful, brilliant video of this. Oh, uh, they think it was about a 30 to 50 meter wide meteor exploding in the skies over Russia at dawn about a 400 kiloton explosion. Hiroshima was a 15 kiloton explosion. And uh, you, would have, you would have these events if we made a new crater the size of Tico today, people would be dying for years from the meteor strikes, hmm. from pieces of the moon landing on earth. So you look at this, this is, you know, uh, 800 kilometers wide. It's not 100 or 150. It's about uh, tranquility is 800 to 1,000, depends on how you measure it. So it's tremendously wide, a huge impact. So let's go ahead and take this and see if we can scale back. And so now we see we've got one, two, three, four, and we get a new one down here. This is Mare Vaporum. And uh, some people call this a different Maria. Some people consider this to be the same thing. But in any case, you get Mar uh, Vaporum. So you've got now five different Maria. And now we can go ahead. Let's take a look at the gibbous moon. And we're seeing it's kind of like a curtain being slowly raised. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like the, uh, the dance of the seven veils. Uh, or those uh, what those car shows where the car is covered with this gigantic silk sheet and the lovely model pulls the sheet away slowly to reveal the new Chevrolet model or whatever it is. And so the Terminator is, is pulling the sheet away and revealing. And again, we go, oh golly, we've got some new features here. And so as we look at these, uh, we can compare the two here <clears throat> and I'm going to scroll down and make sure I'm getting my, my right names here. Uh, bad thing to get the wrong names. So, so Daniel, why yes, did they call it a gibbous moon and, and then, you know, quarter moon to a gibbous moon? Why didn't they call it like a, you know, you know, 
five eighths moon or, or you know three quarters That's... moon or I guess some people might but uh, of course you know the moon is always half lit depending on where you're looking at it much like it's always half lit. uncle would, who remained half lit over half of his life. <laughs> You know, so. We all have that family member, don't we? Yes, we do. Um, it's kind of interesting. And it was really the technical people, the astronomers the, who were working out the details of the moon's orbit between the time of Aristotle and Galileo. And they realized we have this orbit and they looked at it kind of from a celestial perspective. Waxing simply means growing. Crescent is obvious. Gibbous means fat. Gibbous means okay. uh, kind of uh, obese, if you will. And the moon here is not fully round, but it definitely gives the impression of someone who's who's grown very, uh, very comfortably uh, filled out and plump. And so <laughs> the moon is now becoming plump. It's no longer this uh, well-defined, uh, let's see if I can put up two images here to compare. I think I can. And yeah, here we go. Here's this nice moon divided very neatly in half. And here we see, oh, it's continuing to grow. It's continuing to wax and grow larger and plump. And the name gibbous was used. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is waxing gibbous because it is progressing from a smaller half lit quarter moon to a two thirds illuminated gibbous moon. And the interesting thing, the uh, quarter moon occurs almost exactly seven days after new moon. The gibbous moon, this moon is about 10 to 11 days old and out of the new. And we, we start to realize, but wait a minute, isn't this the line between sunrise and sunset, this terminator. And wait, we've taken 11 days for this to go all the way around just to here. And we start to realize, wow, the moon spins much more slowly than the earth does. If you could do as the Apollo astronauts did, but in a more leisurely way, you know, who wants to be rushed on vacation? Right. Go spend uh, uh, 10 days or so on the moon and you could watch the earth you would see the earth uh, rotating once a day. So it's it would change um, much more quickly than the moon, but the moon is not only not rotating from our perspective, we see the same half of the moon at all times, but we see that this daylight, this line between daylight and darkness takes two weeks to cross one hemisphere. The moon's sidereal day is over 700 hours long. It takes the moon 28 days to experience one sunrise and one sunset. So one sidereal day, sunrise to sunrise, you only get one sunrise and one sunset per month on the moon. If you're there, sunrises are going to be much rarer. You don't get a chance to see one tomorrow. If you're keeping an earth clock of 24 hours, then your next sunrise is going to be next month, 28 days later. Uh, and so we're seeing this and we're seeing two great new Maria. This one is called Mare Imbrium, the Sea of Rains or the Imbrium Basin. And this one is called uh, Mare Nubium or the Sea of Clouds. We're also starting to see up north here, we're starting to see a very long linear feature. And this is called Mare Frigorum, the Sea of Cold. And we start to see some majestic craters here. And I'll go ahead and zoom in on this a little bit. If we go and we look between Imbrium and Nubium, this is dominated by this massive crater that we call Copernicus. And Copernicus, this isn't the best view of it, but Copernicus, you can start to see, oh, look, there's structure inside with a good telescope and a nice clear night and good seeing. You can see that the interior is terraced 
much like a terraced garden. Copernicus was a deep cone-shaped crater, but the walls slump and cave in. Even in lunar gravity, you can't maintain this very steep cone shape. And the walls cave in and slide down and fill in the bottom. And you can see evidence of many landslides here. Hmm. These mountains, uh, and I believe these are the Apennines. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. And these mountains, they are interesting. They're in a curved chain. If we back off the magnification here, and we go, oh, wow, weird. There seems to be this line of mountains all the way around this Maria. Scott, mountains on the moon do not form the way mountains form on the Earth. Hmm. Instead of having tectonic plates, which collide and lift up, here we've had a gigantic impact. And mountain-sized chunks of rock have flown out and flown several hundred miles and then landed with a crash mountain in a minute. It's wow. Like easy Mac for geology. <laughs> and so literally had you been there, um, it would not have been a safe place to be, but you, let's say you left your GoPro, you could have seen these mountain sized pieces falling all of a piece. There would be no dust trail behind them. There's no atmosphere to trail the dust behind. So you see this giant mountain and it lands in thunder, silent thunder. The ground would quake a magnitude eight earthquake from a hundred miles away and the ground shakes and the dust settles very quickly. There's no air to suspend it. And there now is a brand new majestic mountain peak four, five, six kilometers high, outrageous as tall as Everest. And it's, it's brand new. It's literally, it wasn't there a minute ago and now it's there. Now there is a crater I, I may have it wrong, but I'm thinking it's like Tycho. And yeah. it, it shows this mountain that has land that is in the middle of the of the crater. Now I'm thinking that that is that is some sort of an effect of the impact itself. Okay. Yes. We then all... there's like this boulder, this huge, yes. huge boulder. Yes, the boulder it's like picture. sitting up there like a cherry on top of an ice cream. Right. Okay? And the boulder they say is something like uh yeah, Half it's a, a kilometer. It's enormous. Central Peak. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's, yeah. And it must have just had fallen straight back down in on itself or something. Yes. I, I can't. We've all seen pictures, of these lovely pictures with a water drop lands on the surface and then it springs up and you've got this ring and you've got this column of water. And essentially, this is what happens with very large craters. Wow. The stone is compressed and then it liquefies and it erupts up and then it freezes in place. And you get these central peaks and the central peaks are really kind of unique because they're often materials that have rebounded up from deep within the mantle, many kilometers down. And so you're seeing these central peaks, if we could go with our geologist hammer and our drill corer, we would get samples of the moon's interior 10, 20 kilometers deep that we could never reach with a drill. Right. And yes, that's this is Tycho right down here and Clavius. Clavius, of course, for movie fans, 2001. This is where the uh, the artifact was buried on the moon that they discovered later in Clavius. And here, of course, is Copernicus. And then this lovely fellow right up here. This is Plato. And this was a probably an existing crater. And the rim isn't destroyed. It's not like we saw earlier over here with lava from uh, tranquility overflowing into the Serenity Basin. This is a lava-filled crater that was probably infilled from underneath. Now, it may have been made shortly after Imbrium was formed. And so it punched down in and the lava just flowed up. But the rim is very nice and beautiful and intact. And we can see Plato separates Mare Imbrium from Mare Frigorum. Well, if we continue our exploration a little bit, and then we take a look at the full moon. And with the full moon, and I process this a little differently. And of course, now we can see 
crises, crisium, fecunditatis, tranquillitatis, serenitatis, vaporum. And now we have imbrium. And down here we have nubium. And now we see the greatest basin of them all. This is Oceanos Prosolarum, the ocean of storms. It's about mm. 2,400 kilometers wide, which means it would stretch from, oh, New York City to Dallas. Wow. It's, it would cover the bulk of the central United States. It's much bigger than Germany for you folks in Europe. Uh, this, is, this is an enormous impact basin. And we don't see all of it because it's much of it is rotated around. Some of it is obscured from us on the far side. But this is Imbrium. And over here we see uh, Kepler. This is Copernicus. This is Kepler. And both of these show a very nice ray system. You see this area of white with the lines coming out. And mm -hmm. this area of lighter terrain, this is an ejecta blanket, Scott. Material has been blasted right. out of the crater yes. and fallen. And then the streaks, and you can see here streaks from Kiko. There. Oh, yeah. And some of these run over 1,000 kilometers. And when the crater rim is being pushed up, that rim is jagged and vaporized pulverized materials being blasted out. <laughs> right. The notches in the crater rim create jets of dust. And these will travel again, as you see here, sometimes thousands of kilometers. And they will land. These rays, these features, are only perhaps a few centimeters thick, about as thick as the stripe we paint on a really? highway. So when we look at the Terminator, we never see them. They're not tall enough to create a shadow, but the pulverized material is like a, a reflector. Hmm. And when we're here on the moon, the sun, when we're staring at the moon this way, the sun is effectively back behind the back of our head. So we're looking at the moon with direct light and these rays and ejecta patterns, they now reflect back light to us and they become visible and we see the ejecta and we see the rays. Wow. And so that's Prosolarum. And Mare Frigorum, you can see now, is a very long, skinny feature that extends about 1,200 kilometers up here. And then down here, we have this little lonely crater. This is Mare Humorum, the Sea of Moisture. And this little crater right here, it's not a very good picture. This is Gassendi, which is about uh, 100 kilometers wide. It's about a 60-mile crater. And its rim has been broken into by lavas from Humorum. And uh, Tico, the brighter the crater generally, Scott, the newer. Yeah. Tico is only 65 million years old. That's all. There are, there are a group of scientists who believe, and I think their evidence is pretty strong, that the dinosaur killer impact at Chicxulub in the Yucatan Peninsula and Tico were two pieces of one asteroid, uh, Baptista, which is now a group. It's an asteroid group. But they think that when it shattered from an impact, that pieces fell inward. And the moon absorbed one hit, but the Yucatan Peninsula took the other one, Ooh. which caused the great uh, extinguish. Ex the mass extinction so, at the so end of the Cretaceous there was period. This cluster, is, is it believed that there were like these this cluster of asteroids that were would have been one thing. Or? Yeah, the cluster of asteroids. And we talk about the idea of, oh, can we disrupt an asteroid that's targeting for Earth? Baptista is a cautionary tale. Because <laughs> Yeah, you break it apart and now it it's more most places. of the pieces are are still there together, yeah. but we got hit with some of the little shrapnel bits, the uh, six to eight mile wide nice. shrapnel. And we see here generally the rule of thumb that craters tend to be about 10 times bigger than the impactor. So Tico being a 90 kilometer crater would have been about a nine kilometer impactor, about a six to seven mile wide impactor. Mm. 
<clears throat> and the the energy is outrageous. We'll do a show next week on impactors, Scott. Okay. Uh, cool. I had an interesting discussion with someone, and we'll take a look. I have some nice photos, and in these nice photos, I saw a crater chain. You mentioned this, and it's a chain of craters. And if we take a look at uh, this picture here, I was looking at, and I took some pictures, and this is Aristarchus and Ptolemaeus and Alphonsus, these three craters. And if you zoom right in, there's this string of about eight or nine craters that are each yeah. about five kilometers wide. And they're in an exact geometric line. And this would have been something that would have been gravitationally disrupted by the Earth. Comet Shoemaker-Levy, of course, we saw these photos of it being strung out into the string of pearls, 20 or 30 smaller cometary pieces. Yeah. This would have been an impactor that would have been about a kilometer wide. It would have been broken up by the Earth's gravity. If it was broken up by Jupiter, they would have been spread out a lot farther. These are all in a line. The crater rims are touching each other. Mm -hmm. So it was just newly disrupted. And I'm thinking, I said, well, a one kilometer crater would absolutely be devastating. It would absolutely. It would. It would. Uh, it would affect climate for a couple of decades, and yeah. uh, it's big enough to cause minor extinction events. Someone said, "Oh, you can't cause an extinction." I'm like, "Well, you know what? Small ecologies are fragile. If you think that we could have a one kilometer impactor." Uh, bullseyeing the United States and not lose species on our continent, you're being foolish. Yeah. But when we come back together next week, we'll talk about impactors. We've seen on the moon how these great titanic impactors of the distant past. And we'll take a look at how impactors affect planets and shape our destinies and oh. why there are scientists right now who are out in the dark uh, worldwide, and they're scanning the skies. And I've seen articles, well, uh, we're sure we've discovered all the big ones. Hubris, hubris, my friends. Eternal <laughs> vigilance is the price, not just of freedom. But, It'll be um, the name of the new crater is hubris. <laughs> the name of the new crater is hubris. That's right. Yes, I think that's a brilliant idea. So we're going to look at some impactor scenarios, and uh, we'll look at some impact sites on the moon and the earth, and we'll see how these impactors shape the surfaces of the worlds on which we live. Oh, very cool. Okay. And so I hope you'll go out, everybody, and take a look and see the moon, rediscover the moon, yeah. become a little more familiar with its challenge. Challenge yourself. You know, I'm going I'm to be challenging yourself. myself too. So Absolutely. So I hope everybody will challenge themselves. Uh, just in terms of book news, we are up to about 4,800 uh, oh. People okay. on the Astronomy for Educators, I want to encourage everybody. It's really kind of misnamed. It's Astronomy for Everyone. And how and, many book downloads have you had since your show started? Um, uh, do you know? In the eight weeks, we've had about 1,500. Excellent. In the eight weeks. And th this audience has been a big part of that. And I'd like you to uh, please download the book. Um, there's a, uh, a survey link, which we'll talk more about that next week. I've been asked uh, to present a couple of papers this summer. Uh, one is going to be for the, uh, and now I'm blanking on the society's name. It's the uh, International Geoscience Teachers Association. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one, interestingly, is the uh, local, is the Arkansas TESOL Conference teaching English to students of other languages. And what I do with STEM, I fully believe that working with models with STEM is, is good training for students who don't yet have a mastery of English. I don't think sure. any of our students has a mastery of technical scientific English. Uh, that's been my experience over 40 years in the classroom. But I want you to encourage everybody to download Astronomy for Educators. It's really astronomy for everyone about three dozen fun activities that you can do to help you understand some of these magnificent things that we look at with our telescopes. And with that, Scott, I want to thank everybody, all our viewers. Uh, I'm, I'm so thrilled and pleased with the outreach we're getting. 
Before you go, yes, uh, you and I were talking a little bit about, I mean, the total segue, but we were talking about um, a new observatory you're building. You talked about your bookshelves yes, and stuff like that, but uh, you're, uh, you're, you're getting to build this um, backyard observatory. I am. And I know that some of our viewers would be interested in that. Perhaps we will, uh, we will make that a show. I think that would be fun. Okay. Um, it's been a long, long journey. I've been talking about uh, my own observatory for uh, over 25 years. And uh, <laughs> this year, uh, my wife encouraged me. She said, you know what? Your birthday is coming up. What do you give to the mad scientist who has all the cool toys? let's build an observatory together. We've wanted one for years. That's cool. And so we're pursuing that and uh, we're going to build, we explored domes. That didn't work because my refractor uh, is, is, well, it's, it's really, really big. Uh, it's, it's a seven meter long or seven foot long, a two meter long tube and a dome just isn't practical. Uh, and so unless you had a really big dome, which is really, really expensive. So we're going to be building a roll-off roof observatory, uh, a rectangular shed type structure, mm -hmm. uh, 16 feet on a side, about almost five meters for our European folk, uh, five meters square with uh, about 1.5 meter high walls. Nice. And then the roof will literally roll off onto a frame and uh, will allow you, will still, even with seven foot high walls, we'll have to park the telescope in its lowest position in order for it yeah, to fit in the silver. <laughs> it's, it's like double your height. I mean, it's crazy. So. It is kind of, it is kind of, when this refractor points straight up, uh, the top of the dew shield is almost 10 feet in the air. Yeah. And your eyepiece is uh, only one meter off the ground, 38 inches or so. Right. And the top is nine and a half feet, 10 feet. So you're still on your knee, knees when you you're are. You're the, literally uh, the telescope at, at the zenith. So and that's uh, that's partly why we're building these this observatory. We can actually mount it high enough to where the lowest position will be one meter high, which you can get a, a low stool and yes. observe comfortably. And uh, I also have designed an observer's chair. Uh, and maybe we'll make that an episode too, how to make an observer's chair that will take a seat height from 18 inches to 50 inches. Mm -hmm. So you can observe with a really big refractor mm -hmm. uh, and do it yourself because it's a fun project. Right. Very cool. All right. Well, Daniel, thank you very much. That was awesome. And we had a great audience today. Uh, lots of um, accolades for you. Uh, Daniel, and um, so that's that's always welcome. Uh, we have the 44th Global Star Party happening uh, tonight at an 8 o'clock. And um, so we're all excited about that. Uh, Cesar Brolo, Brolo was kind enough to be our special guest host. He's a wonderful And he star. is bringing on uh, several Argentinian um astronomers. Uh, one of them is a professional astronomer, uh, and actually maybe two of them. And so um, really excited about that. And Cesar will also give a talk. But you'll see also, uh, of course, David Levy, David Eicher, uh, Molly Wakeling is going to be there. Uh, Libby and the Stars will be there. Uh, uh, John Johnson, and I know I'm leaving some people out right now. Oh, uh, Adrian, uh, uh, Bradfield, I think, is going to be on as well, and uh, or Adrian Bradley, excuse me, and uh, uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun, uh, and I always look forward to the Global Star Party. But you now, normally they happen on Tuesdays, and this one's, of course, this is Tuesday, right? So, but the next one after that is going to happen on International Astronomy Day, which is May fifteenth, and that's Saturday. And that will be co our our special host for that will be the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the uh, Montreal chapter. And so they are going to be bringing people in. You're going to see some of the regulars from our program here, but you're going to see some new people. 
Um, and, um, you know, I've been inviting some uh, others to come on to the program that should be pretty exciting. So uh, we got surprises in store and, um, uh, you know, it's like Christmas for astronomers, International Astronomy Day. So uh, I hope you join us for that. And um, I, it, that one is going to start a little bit earlier. I think we're going to start about maybe six or seven p.m. Central instead of eight p.m. Central. So tonight is eight p.m. Central that's time. Right. Okay. right. And I'll be able to join in more of these because my semester of teaching is now over. So oh, I don't I have the uh, eight a.m. crazy. Right. Wake up and prepare a lecture for eight o'clock the next morning. So I'll be right. able to stay up now like big kids. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. We're looking forward to having you on. So we're good. All right. Well, that's it. And uh, get uh, take a little break, uh, have some dinner, and then join us here in about uh, a little less than three hours. So that's exciting. Talk to you later. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Good night. Bye bye now. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific, and today I want to talk about the world famous Galileo Telescope Kit. This is a kit that you assemble by yourself. You'll learn how optics work by assembling the objective lens uh, and also the eyepiece. And there's two different eyepieces that are in this. It's a 25 power, 20 millimeter eyepiece, but it also comes with this very clever little device here that works both as a Barlow lens that will double the magnification of this eyepiece, making it 50 power, or it can be used also as a Galilean eyepiece, which gives 17 power to the telescope. This is what Galileo virtually saw through his own telescope. So you can have that same experience that Gal Galileo had looking at the moon, uh, looking at Saturn's rings, looking at Jupiter. Uh, it is a telescope that was designed for the International Year of Astronomy in 2009, and uh, it's a fantastic kit, both for child and adult, uh, to learn how a telescope works. And so, if you get the telescope like this, you can either have it on a stand like this, you can hand hold it like a pirate's glass, or on the bottom here, we have a uh, threaded hole here that you can put it on a camera tripod. Very versatile, very rugged, and a lot of fun all from Explore Scientific.